that Hawk, our hero, has been uh, traveled to Sigborg and tried to get a place to stay at the Caddis Tell Inn and found out you have to use money. And he never actually had to use money before. Yeah, in his village, money is not a big thing. Money isn't a thing. So therefore, well, the first two chapters are up on YouTube. Yes. So if you haven't, then you know you can catch up. Uh, we will start with chapter three, Castle on the Hill. All right. Hawk lifted his head and attempted to get his bearings. The tower he'd seen from the overlook stood right across the town center from him. Its chipped, once blue plaster faded in many places to the color of an overcast sky. Through the arches at the top of the tower, Hawk could see a bronze bell, green with age. Some distance off to the left of the tower lay the charred ruins he had seen earlier. The merchants seemed undisturbed by the debris. It must have been there long enough to have become commonplace. Beyond the bell tower to the north, Hawk could see the sandstone turrets of Sigeborg Castle overlooking the town from the foothills. It didn't look very far away at all. If he could make it there and secure work right away, there was a chance he might bring back some silver coins to the caddis before sunset. Glancing at the half dozen merchants, Hawk noticed the, that most of them avoided returning his gaze, seeming nervous and troubled. Only one met his eyes boldly from behind a produce cart, a smiling young girl with a thick flaxen rope of hair tossed forward over her shoulder. Returning her smile, Hawk crossed the town center towards her cart. This, Hawk reasoned, would be an excellent opportunity to practice his charm, which he read was almost as important to the success of a great hero as strength and skill. As he approached, he noticed with a little shock that the smiling girl had the hindquarters of a Palomino filly. Hawk had read in How to Be a Hero that centaur farmers were fairly common in this part of this world. He had even seen a picture which, de which depicted a powerful looking man with the body of a jet black draft horse. Nothing, however, could have borne less resemblance to that drawing than the young filly at the protos cart. She giggled and twitched her large pointed ears as Hawk approached. Hawk struck a casual yet manly pose and tried to think of something charming to say. But as he looked from the centaur's girl's long lashed brown eyes to her gently swishing flaxen tail, he found himself drawing a blank. All he could do was stare. Do you like what you see? She said, patting her, patting her eyelashes. Here in Sigeborg, I mean she added before Hawk could reply. It is not often we have strangers here, particularly not tall, handsome strangers like you. Um, yes. Suddenly Hawk's tongue seemed to be made of boot leather. I mean, I mean, thanks. The town. Uh, I, I'm new. Are you staying here long? Said the filly brightly. I hope you will do so. Perhaps I can show you around the town after I close my vegetable stand for the night. Hawk stared at her. Surely she wasn't insinuating what he thought she was insinuating. I, I'll, uh, I'll be staying a while, but, but I'm an adventurer, you know, so I'm good at finding my way around. <gasps> an adventurer? You must be very brave to come to Sigeborg. She glanced coquettishly for a moment, flipping her tail. Then she looked back up, her eyes sparkling. If you like to go adventuring with me later, I know a place where we could spend the night together. Hawk's jaw dropped, and he took a step back, raising his hands. Ho, oh, ho, ho, there, ho, horsey, he blurted. As soon as he saw the look of shock indignation on the girl's face, Hawk realized what he had said. Horsey, she cried, her nostrils flashing, glaring. I am a centaur, not some animal. You men are all alike. She then pointedly turned around to show him her, her, her equine side. No, said, Todd, said Hawk, stepping forward. I just, I didn't. He couldn't begin to imagine what sort of apology would be appropriate. 
He stepped in too close, however, and a furious swipe of the filly's tail caught him across the cheek. Eyes watering, Hawk backed off, fighting his humiliation and annoyance. What did she expect? It was her fault for being so forward, wasn't it? With a sigh, Hawk put his hand to his stinging cheek and trudged along the north road, making a mental note to reread the section on charm. The northern no town gate stood open, just like the western one through which he had entered the town. The road leading out of it wound up into the foothills. A short distance from the town, the road crossed over the same crystalline streamlet that he had seen before. The sight of a neglected cemetery, cemetery some distance to the east, with moss-shrouded crypts and precariously leaning tombstones, sobered Hawk for a moment. His good spirits returned, however, as he rounded the curve in the road that brought him to a spectacular look of Sigborg Castle. The castle's blocky towers were anchored at atop a patch of high ground, and the keep was encircled by a wall even larger than the one around the town. A heavy iron portcullis prevented entry, and even from this distance, Hawk could see a lone guard patrolling the battlements. Only one? The picture in his book had shown him at least a dozen guards. His heart soared. Of course, this was why he was here. Obviously, they had a shortage of strong young men to stand guard. Imagining himself pacing the battlements, proudly wearing the colors of Sigborg, Hawk couldn't help but think of his brothers and sister. Not only would they never have to go back to Alpendorf, they'd be so proud of him. As he watched the castle loom closer and closer, appearing more and more majestic, his daydreams began to increase in stature as well. Why settle for just being a castle guard and adventurer here in Sigborg? Maybe one day he could travel to distant lands and become a hero there as well. On the first page of the first chapter of his manual, Hawk had found the definition of the term hero. That champion of champions who, having had such a title bestowed ceremoniously upon the person by king, queen, emperor, sultan, grand duke, or other applicable sovereign, shall protect said patron's hereditary estate from peril until the occasion of a aforementioned champion's decease, natural or otherwise. The manual went on further to state that the official hero of the land would be supported in a fine style by his patron, and have a pick of eligible damsels to choose for his wife. Fame, wealth, romance, and danger. Hawk couldn't imagine a better life than that. Hawk approached the portcullis of the Sigward Castle, feeling a bit lighter of heart and body, excitement easing the soreness in his muscles. Hello, he called out to the castle wall. I wish to enter the castle. There was no answer. Where did the guard go? It was impossible to tell from here. Hello, he called out again. Anyone at home? Again, no one replied to his call. Maybe the guard was hard of hearing. Hawk walked up to the portcullis, drew his sword, and banged the hilt on the iron bars with tremendous clanging. To Hawk's satisfaction, the racket drew the attention of the guard, whose head suddenly appeared from a low tower window. The guard was burly and tanned, with a large bristling mustache that seemed to be the local fashion. There was an odd streak of white in his left eyebrow that did not appear to be from age, although it was hard to tell just how old he was. What's going on down there? What has happened? The guard shouted, looking surprised and alarmed. Everything's all right, said Hawk hurriedly, feeling a bit foolish. Sorry to alarm you. I, I'm Hawk. I'm new in town. The guard stared at him for a moment, narrowing his eyes. What business do you have at Sigvord Castle? he asked coldly. I was hoping to speak with the lord of the castle, Hawk ventured. The guard gave a curt shake of his head. The Baron sees no one. All right, then, said Hawk with a respectful nod. Who's in charge of hiring the castle guards? I'm 16, and I have a sword of my own, and I'd like to apply. 
For some reason, the older man scowled. It was a moment before he replied. I am in charge of such things, he said bitterly. My name is Carl, but I am not hiring any more guards, nor would I ever hire an inexperienced boy for such a job. I'm a hard worker, said Hawk, and very strong. Carl studied Hawk again. Strong, you say? Very. I'm an adventurer in dire need of some silver for a night's stay at the inn. At the word adventurer, a light slowly seemed to go on behind Carl's eyes. The expression changed his entire face. It was like watching a great door swing open. Perhaps I can help you after all, he said. The castle does need someone who is not afraid to sweat a little, although I have to warn you. Working here is not very glamorous. That's fine, said Hawk with a smile. Just being at the castle was glamorous enough for him. Just a minute while I open the sally port, Carl disappeared from the window. A few minutes later, a small door opened at ground level several feet from the portcullis, and Carl appeared with it, gesturing for Hawk to enter. Thank you, Hawk said hurrying inside and then t uh, turning to offer Carl a deep bow. You won't regret this, I promise. I am always glad to have the chance to help out an adventurer, said Carl warmly. Hawk looked around at the unkept castle courtyard, whose paving stones were choked with wild grass and weeds. Off to the left was what looked like the guard's barracks, and to the right sprawled a large stable yard full of horses. Directly forward from the gate was the main castle, keeping all its austere majesty. Hawk looked over at Carl, awaiting his first orders. That way, said Carl, pointing to the building to the right. Ask for the stable master, and if he gives you any trouble, tell him I sent you. The stables. Hawk had never ridden before, but he supposed he could learn. His eyes scanned the an animals in the paddock as he approached. Most of them were aging and swayback, hardly appropriate mounts for a dashing young castle guard. Then he noticed a sleek black stallion with a proud arch to its neck. Just as Hawk was ready to approach for a closer look, the wind shifted, and he almost choked. Obviously, the paving stones weren't the only part of the castle that had been neglected. Hawk looked at the stable and inside he could barely make out the so piles of sodden straw, dark with manure. Hawk decided not to approach any closer. Anyone here? he called out. A grudgy, grungy, heavy-set man appeared from inside the stable, looking as though he had been startled from a nap. How could anyone sleep in the middle of this stinking mess? Are you the stable master? Hawk asked. That's me, the man said, scratching his groin. And you are? Hawk, I'm an adventurer. I wanted to start work, and Carl sent me over here. Great, said the stable master. This, sure, this place sure needs it. Grab a shuffle there by your feet. Hawk blanched. I beg your pardon? You heard me. Been a while since I had a good stable boy. Actually, I came here to work as a guard. Carl said, Carl said for you to come see me because I need a stable boy and I'm guessing you need a few Wanda. Wipe that look off your face. You're lucky to get work at all around here. Now get work moving. My purse strings don't come undone until this place is as clean as a whistle. And then, three mond. Hawk's heart dropped to his boots. Without another word, he turned and started to walk away. Hey, where are you going? Hawk turned and glared at the stable master. I am not a stable boy, and three mond won't do me any good anyway. I need five to stay at the inn. The stable master looked around. Well, I suppose this place is a few days overdue for a good cleaning. So I'll throw in a couple extra if you do good. Hawk looked at the shovel. He looked at the horde of flies buzzling, buzzing around the stable doorway and the calf-deep 
layer of horse manure. All this filthy work for a measly five manda, it couldn't be worth it. With a groan, he thought of the warm fireplace at the hero's tail end and the promise of a soft feather bed. Then he thought of last night, curled up on the frozen ground, shivering too violently to sleep. Hawk picked up the shovel and trudged towards the stable. He could handle it, couldn't he? He was, after all, an adventurer, and it wouldn't be due to cut whining after a little bit of hardship. On page 19 of How to Be a Hero, it clearly stated that an adventurer must face every challenge with grace and dignity. Hawk lifted his chin as he entered the stable. So where do I... He didn't get to finish his question. Looking up when he ought to have been looking down, Hawk stumbled over a loose floorboard and landed elbows deep in the pile of manure. The stable reverberated with the stable master's raucous laughter. Even the black horse outside in the paddock seemed to snicker at him. Hawk got to his feet without a word and went to work. By the time he'd finished shoveling and had started laying down the fresh straw, muscles he didn't even know he had were on fire from with agony. His arms and legs shook from exhaustion and he could barely walk in a straight line. Plus, he stank. The stable master had meanwhile fallen back to sleep, which was fine. Hawk was tired of being laughed at. When the straw was laid, Hawk poked the stable master gently with the pitchfork. I'm finished. The stable master snorted, grumbled, and reached into his coin purse. Here you go, he said, handing Hawk three silver coins. Intrigued, Hawk looked them over in his hand. On one side of each coin was a crescent moon, on the other the profile of a noble, of a nobleman. Then Hawk frowned. Hey, we agreed on five munde. The stable master seemed to consider it, but Hawk bore holes into him with his eyes, and at last the flabby man relented, producing two more coins. See you tomorrow, the man said. Don't count on it, said Hawk. There had to be an easier way to make five munde, like maybe walking to, to Sangerhofen, mining the silver there, and minting the coins himself. Hawk smelled worse than the stable. He imagined the inn would have a bathtub of some kind, maybe even warm water. He sighed in anticipation as he handed back toward the castle gate. On the way, a movement in the castle courtyard caught his attention, and he stopped. A lithe, stylish man of indeterminate age, with hair so black it was almost certainly dyed, was shadow-fencing in the courtyard. His clothes were of the finest velvet, and his boots gleamed in the ruddy light of the sinking sun. The man's finery, however, didn't interest Hawk nearly as much as his elegant longsword. The man was in the midst of a fierce battle against an invisible opponent. Hawk didn't know much about sword play, but it was easy to tell that this man was the master of the art. Hawk stood and watched him for a moment, lost in the beauty and deadly economy of the man's movements. Excuse me, sir, said Hawk at last. The man continued to shadow walk fencing. Hawk came a bit closer. Sir, he repeated. The man stopped, sheathing his sword with a graceful flourish. Are you addressing me? He said. Yes, I... The man held up a hand and waved him away. Please do not come any closer. You offend me with your stench. Hawk stopped, blinked. The man's tone was insulting, but he did have a point. My name is Hawk, he said. I couldn't help but notice your skill at swordplay. I am the Schirmeister of Spellberg, the man said. I have taught the art of swords to kings and noblemen the world over. I would be honored to learn from you, sir, said Hawk, delighted. The Schirmeister Meister made a sound as though he had swallowed a bug. 
I do not waste my skills on peasants. I really do need to learn, Hawk insisted. See, I was given this sword. He drew his weapon, angling it so the older man could see the light of the sunset gleaming off its blade. The Shearmeister's eyes suddenly grew hard and bright. Let me look at it, he demanded. Instinctively, Hawk pulled the sword closer to his chest, then grinned. Care to fight for it? Fool, the man scoffed. You think I would spar with the likes of you just to see your weapon? I am paid to train only the best of students. Pay me properly, and perhaps I will show you how such a weapon is used. Hawk slipped his hand into the belt pouch and felt the cool silver of, a co of the coins there, coins that would buy him a bath, a fire, and a feather bed. On the other hand, he hadn't come to Sigborg to sleep comfortably. He came to learn a trade. His trade was adventuring, and his tool was a sword. On the other hand, it simply wasn't practical. He needed a safe night's sleep. Besides, judging by the velvet and the hair dye, Hawk probably couldn't afford this man's price. How much would it cost? Hawk heard himself asking. I shall be magnanimous in this situation, since it will not take much time. A single coin will suffice. Hawk's heart leaped, and before it, he knew it, he had pulled out a silver and sent it spinning in the air towards the shearmeister. The man grabbed it effortlessly and looked at it. Then he pocketed it and spit on the paving stones. Amand, he snapped, do you think that I, sword master revered by all of Krigsland? would demonstrate my my prowess for a commoner's coin? I, who have never soiled my gloves with anything less than gold? I will not forget such an insult from you. Before Hawk could even speak through his chagrin, the Shearmeister had already stormed across the courtyard, slamming the door of the castle barracks behind him. Hawk cautiously approached the door, rapping once. Um... Can I have my money back? Just, uh, Hawk heard the sound of the door being barred violently. He took that as a no. Just then a single mournful note sounded from the bell tower in town. Hawk glanced at the sinking sun and didn't have to guess what that bell meant. The gates were closing. How soon he couldn't t be certain, but he'd have to get moving. It was a long, cold, miserable jog back to the overground path. The wind cut him to the bone and it was getting hard to see. As he passed the distant gates of the old cemetery, he gave an involuntary shudder, not just because of the cold. Forcing himself to look away, he gripped the pommel of his sword and concentrated at the task at hand. How could he pay for a night's rest if he only had four mond? Now it seemed it would be an excellent opportunity to practice his heroic eloquence. Halfway to town, the bell chimed a second time. Hawk burst into a run. When he finally reached the town, much to his relief, he found the northern gate still open. He entered and approached a barrel full of half-frozen water, attempting to wash the worst of the grime from his face and hands. The water was so cold it burnt and an ice chip scratched his cheek. As he finished, he heard heavy footsteps coming toward him. Hawk turned and saw Otto the goon trudging towards the northern gate. Hawk froze, not exactly frightened, but not exactly wanting to strike up a conversation either. Otto stood by the gate for a moment, as though waiting for something. Then the bell, bell tower chimed a third time. From inside the town walls, the bell made a powerful, melancholy sound that set a shiver, shiver up Hawk's spine. As if on cue, Otto turned a huge crank, lowering a heavy wooden gate. The gate hit the cobblestones with a thud. Then Otto turned, grinning foolishly at Hawk, and lumbered back along a side street. Hawk waited until Otto had gone, then started breathing again and headed for the center of town. 
When Hawk entered the hero's tail end, Shamin rose from a large pillow in front of the fireplace and bowed to him. Welcome back, young hero, the cat said. Then it choked as he got a whiff of Hawk. But what terrible thing has happened to you? You are, that is to say, you're, Shamin faltered, obviously unwilling to offend. The only job I could find was to clean the stables, Hawk said apologetically. The cat shuddered at the concept. It is most appalling that a great adventurer should be forced to perform such task. However, you must leave immediately before Shima discovers your condition. She has only just changed the sheets in the bedrooms. Leave? Hawk replied indignantly, but remembered the advice of the manual. Eloquence and persuasion were important skills for an adventurer. Calming himself, Hawk let his disappointment showing on his face. But I only accepted that horrible job so I could spend the night here. Shamin's whiskers drooped sadly. As I worked, continued Hawk, as awful as it was, I comforted myself by thinking of your wonderful inn and, and how nice it would be to stay here. Shamin looked at Hawk over once more then sighed tragically. Very well, he said at last, but I will need your five silvers in advance. Hawk squirmed. Un unfortunately, he said, I only have four silvers. Shamin's ears flattened. Under other circumstances, he said, I might be more generous but I am concerned about Shima's fine linens. They will need to be washed in water, which we Kata avoid as much as possible. I'll be happy to wash them myself, offered Hawk. Shamin's tail twitched once, but his ears remained firmly against his head. A and after dinner, I can wash the dishes for you. Shamin's ears perked up, and Hawk knew he'd won. Amazing what he could accomplish just by reading the manual. After Hawk had bathed, eaten, and buffed the last teapot to an elegant shine, he was completely exhausted. Shima silently showed him up the stairs to his room, which was by far the nicest Hawk had ever seen. The bed was small and covered with a luxuriant, if slightly faded, quilt. A hinged wooden chest sat on the floor, perfect for storing excess belongings once he acquired some. As he walked into the room, a movement caught his eye, and he turned to look. He froze in shock. Falcon, he said aloud. But even as he spoke, he saw the apparition's lips move, and he realized his mistake. Feeling his ears tingle with embarrassment, he crossed to the looking glass and touched it. The mirror was just his height, freestanding and framed by an oval of carved wood. He felt Shima's eyes on him and blushed. The glass is so clean and smooth, he said to her in, in Silmarian, not really sure if she understood. I, I've never seen my reflection so clearly. Shima smiled shyly. Hawk looked at the glass again. I thought, for a second, I thought it was my brother Falcon. We're twins. I, I didn't realize how alike we were. Hawk passed his hand over the glass without touching it, watching his reflection do the same. It was eerie. Hawk knew it was his own reflection, but in every bone in his body still cried out Falcon. Those clear, pale blue eyes, the straight nose, the, the strong, angular jaw, the, a face that made villager girls stop and stare, even though Falcon never seemed to notice. Suddenly, Hawk's ver vision blurred suspiciously. With sudden energy, he hefted the mirror and turned it to face the wall. Shima still stood watching him with cat-like curiosity. Hawk sat on his bed, sinking into the down mattress. He pulled out his hero's manual and laid it on his lap, running his hand over the front pages to smooth them. He looked back at Shima, and she glanced at the mirror, her entire body a question. You don't need to take it away right away, said Hawk. 
I just didn't want to look at it right now. He wasn't sure how much Shima understood, but it felt good to talk. I left my family behind, he confessed. Falcon and my younger brother Al and Ren, she's the youngest. The villagers called us all by bird names because they found us one morning in the middle of the village as though we had dropped from the sky. Hawk looked up to see if he was boring Shima. She watched him with solemn interest, her tail twitching over so slightly at the tip. I'm here to try to find a better place for us. I'm trying to help, but I didn't tell them I was going to leave. I just left a note because I knew Falcon wouldn't understand. Shima just watched him, her ears pricked forward as though she was trying to catch every word. Do you ever get homesick? Hawk asked her, looking up. Her flattened ears, the sudden shining of her eyes, and the quick bowing of her head removed all doubt in Hawk's mind that she could understand what he, what he was saying. It must be hard, he said, being so far from home. I, at least, I know my family is just a day or two away. He smiled at her. Thank you so much for the room and for being so kind. Shima gave a smile and a final bow, then slipped silently from the room, shutting the door behind her. Somehow, with Shima's comforting presence gone, Hawk's fleeting sense of rightness fled as well. The room was darker without the light from downstairs pouring inside. A single candle sputtered next to the bed, and a small glass-paned window revealed nothing but deepening shadows. Hawk stripped down to his underclothes and lay down on the bed, which was more comfortable than he'd ever been felt. But when he closed his eyes, he could swear he felt Falcon watching him in the darkness, pale blue eyes full of hurt and reprimand. When he opened them, of course Falcon wasn't there. Strangely, Hawk found himself unable to sleep. Had the note been enough? Hawk was doing the right thing. He was sure of it. But would Falcon understand? Would the others? The darkness continued to gather outside the window, but Hawk just lay there, his heart heavy and his eyes wide open. The darkness was also gathering in Alpendorf. There, at the edge of the village, Falcon stood watch. It was getting difficult for him to make out the silhouettes of even the nearest huts in the gloom of nightfall. Still, he stood looking out into the darkness, sure that every twig snap, every shadow, was his brother's returning home. Falcon had volunteered to close the gates, and he knew he couldn't hold them open much lo longer. Nevertheless, he stood in the gateway until there was nothing left to stare at except the blackness thick enough to make him feel he'd gone blind. Even when he then, he stood a moment longer, straining his ears and his eyes against the empty night. In his mind, he reread the note Hawk had left on the table yesterday. Guys, gone to Sigborg, be back soon. If Hawk did go all the way to Sigborg, he couldn't possibly come home tonight. Still, Falcon didn't want to take the chance that Hawk arrived late and was trapped outside the gates at night. Why Sigborg? Why now? Falcon and Hawk had futilely tried all winter to get the village elders to let them stay together as a family. They had only a few days left to convince the elders that Hawk, that Owl could take Auntie Willie's place as an herbalist. The elders would never be convinced that Hawk and Falcon could support their family if the elders realized Hawk had run off. Obviously, Falcon would just have to go after him. It would only be a few days trip just long enough to find Hawk and bring him back. Wren couldn't get in too much trouble in those few days, could she? Besides, Owl and Wren would be together. Hawk was all alone. Alone. Hawkin shivered at the thought. The four of them had always been set apart from the other villagers, but they had always had each other. Until now. The choice was clear. In the morning, he would take his shield from where it hung for 11 years on Wilhelm, Helma, Wilhelmina's wall. Praying he wouldn't need its protection, he would leave for Sigborg at the break of dawn. And that is chapter three of By the Book.